Lord, we do come before you and we ask that you would allow us to celebrate properly in a decision that was made in our country. We pray for those persons that were supporters of Hillary Clinton and persons that have a worldview that is outside the perimeters of what you have designed for us, that you would cause them to see and know the truth. We pray for the salvation of souls in our country. We pray, Lord, that you would turn hearts to you and to truth. We pray, God, that you would allow people to know what truth is and to embrace that truth. You would give us discernment again. We do recognize our own shortcomings, and even we who would consider ourselves to have a biblical worldview and as a conservative people, we've allowed many things to happen on our watch that we are ashamed of. Today, we make effort to repent before you, before men, for those things. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the sins of the people in this country. We recognize that we cannot pray by proxy for individuals, but we can certainly pray for our country. And as a new beginning comes upon us, Lord, that this would be a time when we, each one, would humbly go before you and that we would lay down our own personal agendas and our pride so that we might look to you and to you alone for the healing of our nation. We thank you for it, Lord. We also pray today for others that are around the world that are looking people that would see changes taking place here. We do pray, Lord, that there would be an opportunity for everyone to see what can be done when a people will act upon the proper constitutional rule and the proper methods by which our republic has been established and in the voting process be able to make changes ethically and morally and righteously. We pray, Lord, for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel, uh, recognizing that that is a great controversy to so many, but we stand with them as you have given us command in your word. Blessed are those who bless your people, Israel, and so we do bless them. We pray for them today. We also pray, Lord, about these various political wars that are taking place around the world the difficulties that are happening, and as much as we think that we know some of the things about these kinds of tensions, uh, there's so much that we don't know, and we also recognize that even amidst the things that we do know and when we stand for righteousness and for truth, that there are people that are suffering, and we pray for the suffering around the world today. We pray for the persecuted church today. We pray for pastors, leaders, elders, deacons, families, Christians, that suffer greatly as the result of sin and the violence that is against the truth. And Lord, we pray for their protection. Today, we also pray for Pastor X. We pray, Lord, for the safe journey for him in the processes of those things that are developing there uh, for him and with his family and with the ministry that you have intended for him. And we ask, Lord, that you would open a pathway for him to be able to fruitfully legally and righteously be able to move forward in ministry, the ministry that you've called him to. Let us be a part of that in any way possible. And we thank you, Lord, for your word as we open it today. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide our hearts, our minds, that you would cause us to grow as a result of your word. For we give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Continuing our study through the book of Matthew, the next two or three weeks, with certainty, there will be sort of some jumping around. Uh, The storyline kind of changes scenes, much like a movie, where you can see something happening in one environment and then something else happening at the same time. I'm going to try to piece this together so that we have some continuity to the flow and to the storyline without missing anything. Some of the things that we'll be discussing over the next weeks we've touched on already. We've talked a little bit about Judas and his betrayal. We'll talk more about that. We have not yet talked about 
Peter's denial. We will spend some time talking about Peter's denial and some of the details related to it. Today we begin to pick up right after the arrest of Jesus in the Gethsemane and where he is taken for trial. In the process of putting thoughts together, I try to soak myself, if you will, into the Bible, and I read as much as I can uh, in process of information. And um, in this case, we have four Gospels, all of which have pieces and parts of the information about the arrest of Jesus and the trials that he went through. It's not going to be possible for us to go through and read each one and organize those, and so I'll make mention of them. I'm going to take you to John today as well as in Matthew uh, with a purpose in mind, but I want to point out to you, sort of as an introduction to today's study, that Jesus endured six evaluations or examinations, or you would say was tried uh, in six different ways. I find that to be interesting all by itself. Um, why six? Now, God doesn't do anything by accident. And uh, six is the number of man in the Bible. Six is the number of that which comes short of completeness. Seven is the number of completeness in Scripture. And things that work in complete cycles in the Bible always run in sevens. And so I find this to be of interest. Uh, the commentaries won't mention this, I'm certain. Uh, but me as a kind of outside the box thinker, it means something to me. I, when I look at this stuff, I say, well, there's got to be a reason that there's only six, and it dawns on me, and I'll conclude with this later today, that there is actually a seventh trial. There's six that we find in the Bible. The seventh is actually alluded to in scripture and quite frankly uh, is documented well. Uh, but there is also another one that we would have as a little more elusive. And so I would like to just bring it to your attention now at the introduction because I don't want to miss it later depending on time. Six trials before men. Three of them were religious leaders and three of them were civil leaders. Those before Pilate and Herod under the Romans, uh, civil. Those before Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, religious, religious in nature. There is something to be said about that process. Jesus would be tried under the law. Now, we already know that the way that they tried him was outside the legal limits. They violated their own law, but in an attempt to use their law, to convict Jesus of blasphemy, which we'll see in the text. The Jews then took Jesus before the Romans because they had at the moment lost their ability to execute by way of crucifixion, which was what they wanted. There is some discussion about uh, the fact that the Jews occasionally stoned people. That was occasional, and it seems that in history there were, was allowance for that only by default, not because they had the legal authority. So in the absence of a judiciary that would oversee, uh, there was in history a vacation of the office at a short time, for a short time, during which time you have a stoning, for example, the, the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. But technically, the scepter that gave them the right, the legal authority to make judgments for death penalty had been removed from the Jews by their own uh, guilt and by their rebellion against God when they came under the jurisdiction and leadership of Rome. And so the Romans were a disciplinary agency for Israel and the Bible tells us very clearly that the scepter should not depart from Israel until Messiah comes, or Shiloh. Uh, and so when they lost their ability to execute, then they would be aware of the fact in biblical prophecy that the Messiah would be on the scene. They were unaware 
of Jesus as Messiah. They rebelliously rejected him. Had their eyes been opened, had they been aware, they would have not crucified the king of glory. But they did crucify him. And in this case, they went through their process of holding him in contempt by saying that he was God, that, or he himself declaring that he was God, and that he was therefore blaspheming. Earlier, it was because of his work on the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath day, and the Jews were irate about it. And so they then, having tried Jesus in their legal system under the Jewish rule, uh, even though unjustly and outside of the boundaries of what the law would require, uh, they then took Jesus to civil courts uh, for the death penalty to be uh, exercised in Jesus' case by crucifixion, which they wanted. They definitively wanted him to suffer. And so you have three trials under religious leaders and three trials under judicial or legal leaders, and it still leaves you with the seventh. I would suggest to you that on the seventh trial, the first person to make a judgment was God. Now, we know that the Bible says that it pleased God to bruise him and to make his soul an offering for sin. And so God was the one that, from before the foundations of the world, planned for the crucifixion, they pierced his hands and feet. We see that in the prophecies. Uh, a form of punishment and, and uh, execution that was not earlier practiced, even in prophecy during those times, it was not practiced. And uh, yet the Bible was very clear about it. And God, from before the foundations of the world, in the divine council, planned for the redemption of mankind in Christ by way of his sacrificial death on the cross. But then there was the resurrection. And in my position, I would like to suggest to you that that was the final verdict of a seventh trial. When Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God, it was God's way of saying, well done, innocent, stand. Complete. See, I'm crying already. But there's another you. What decision will you make? Now, I'm talking to the church, I'm talking to the choir, and maybe there's somebody here that is visiting. Maybe there's somebody listening online that is yet to make a decision about Jesus. For you, this is your seventh trial. This is the seventh trial that we find alluded to in Scripture, not so much overtly communicated. What decision will you make about Jesus? I digress. I'm not an evangelist. And admittedly, my focus, my attention is on the church, on Christians, and equipping you. And I've also told you that there's only one place in the New Testament that tells us to pray for the unsaved. But there is one place in the New Testament that tells us to pray for the unsaved. That's enough. When I pastored in California, I used to drive down into the Livermore Valley, coming in from Sacramento where most of my family lived and coming over the Altamont Pass. We used to call it the land of the airplane propellers. They have the windmills out there. If you've ever driven through there, they're located in many places now, but it was one of the first places in the country that had those turbines that were driven by wind to create electricity. And every time I would drive down into the valley, I would pray, God, save souls. 
in this city. A few years later into the 12 years that I served as pastor there in that area, somebody put a cross into the landscape on the side of the mountain as you would go back out of Livermore into Tracy. On the side of the hill there, they used a plow and they plowed a cross in there that said Jesus saves in the, in the grass. It is still there to this day. Brendan and I were there a couple of weeks ago and I just marveled as I thought about it and thought about my history there. And We still find a, a sense of fondness when we go there to visit. It's why we tend to go there once in a while just to relax and hang out. And I remembered praying as I would be in that city, God, give us the city. Let us see souls saved. This morning I drove around for a few minutes just kind of trying to get my head together around this morning's message, thinking. And I looked around our own community and I said, God, I used to pray for Livermore. Give us souls in Coeur d'Alene. Give us souls in Longmont. Give us souls in Thailand. Give us souls on those military bases where we have men and women that watch our service. Ships. I got an email from a guy that's located out at sea and he watches our services. You hear about these people and I say, God, give us souls. Now is our time to stand up and move forward. And God, give us souls. Let us be prepared to serve them. Let us have individuals that will take their opportunity at the seventh trial and say, well done, I believe. Amen? I've said enough, I could probably be done. That was the conclusion, now let's study. Matthew chapter 26 and John chapter 18. I want to take you to both places as we begin a journey. The disciples... It says in the last part of verse 56, fled. There's some discussion about how, when. It seems that John and Peter trailed along behind Mark, possibly. There's a few different pieces of the story. Some of them, Jesus actually commissioned to leave the environment. In fact, Jesus told the Romans, the troop of Romans that came out to arrest him, Uh, He said, uh, if you've come to get me, then let these others go. That would have been an indication from Jesus to these disciples to take off. Mark, it would appear, was a guy that must have been at some point asleep before they crossed the Kidron Valley. And when Jesus woke everybody to this time of walking, he must have grabbed a sheet and wrapped it around him and walked across the Kidron Valley and over into the Gethsemane with just a sheet wrapped around his naked body. The Bible talks about a young man, and it's in the gospel, where he says in the, during a time of difficulty, uh, the guards giving him a hard time, he was stripped of his sheet and ran away naked. John appears to be one of the individuals that had some kind of connection to the high priest Caiaphas, and was able to go in to hear the trial of Jesus. And Peter, who trailed along outside later, was allowed in. And again, trying to piece some of this together without going through all the details with you by reading to give you an idea that all the disciples fled and at various times they would still disappear. But in this context, we had at least Mark for a short time, John at length and even at the cross, and then Peter, uh, who, as you know, was ended up inside uh, the Caiaphas house where he would be uh, observing 
to see, as we'll read, the end. We'll talk about Peter when we talk about the denial that Jesus mentioned to him and when he actually did fulfill the prophecies of Jesus when he denied the Lord three times. But in this context, we pick up there. And so let's go to John chapter 18 as we begin. John chapter 18 gives us the first part of the trial under Annas. Verse 12, then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first. In the Matthew passage, we don't see it. We see Caiaphas, but first to Annas. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And for more than a year, but that particular year is what is being indicated. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, rather than take you there, I mentioned to you that after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Jews were very upset. And they said, look, this guy is making too much noise. He's doing too many miraculous things. If we don't stop him, the people are going to hail him as king and it's going to jeopardize our safety under Roman rule. That was a problem already. Remember when Jesus was born 33 years earlier, Herod and all of Israel was troubled when they heard the news that the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem, when the wise men had come. And they didn't take the time to go to Bethlehem to see anything about it. The wise men did, but all of Israel was troubled. They were comfortable under Roman rule. It's very much the same as what had happened with the children of Israel in Babylon, where they had become comfortable in Babylon. God had even exhorted them to build houses and to occupy themselves while they were in Babylon, and that if they were a blessing to Babylon, it would go well with them, and that they would be able to uh, themselves have a more peaceful existence in Babylon if they would just attend to themselves and do uh, the business of as usual of living in Babylon. And now the same thing kind of translates into Israel under Roman rule, where they're just happy to live under oppression. How many people today are happy to live under oppression? Well, <laughs> yeah. And so Caiaphas was in the Sanhedrin. Uh, he, as high priest, would have had to be. And he was one of the members of the judicial court of the Jews. And so they're having a conversation. And they're saying, what are we going to do? And he rebukes the group and says, you guys don't know nothing. It is expedient that one man should die for, that the people might be saved. And he was actually, according to the scripture, as high priest that year, who, a man who hated the Lord, prophesying. God came upon him and it caused him to prophesy as an unbeliever. We've seen this in times past in the Old Testament. And so he goes forward and says, it is expedient that one man should die for the people. And then goes on to say, and for others, for all people. Not realizing what he was saying. Now, in his mind, he was actually saying, if we can kill Jesus, that will go well for us in relationship to our, uh, our, our rulers, the Romans at the time but he really had no idea what he was actually saying. That it was expedient that one man should die for the sins of the people, which, of course, Jesus did. But Annas, why is Annas called the high priest and then Caiaphas, who's the high priest? Well, Annas was apparently at least at some levels it would appear more cautious to be defensive for the Jewish cause because earlier 
a few years earlier, the Romans removed Annas from power. And so they appointed then Caiaphas to be the high priest who seemingly had, this is a lot of assumption, seemingly had more of an allegiance to Rome, even though he himself being high priest, a Jew, a member of the Sanhedrin and so forth, but in that comfortable condition of being in submission to Rome. And it's not so much. Now, it seems that the Jews, many of them still viewed Annas as the authority, even though he'd been removed from power by the government. And so they first go to Annas, and they go to have Jesus tried, and then, of course, you'll see they take him uh, before Caiaphas. Now, verse 15 says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, as so did another disciple. That's John. Now the disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Peter stood at the door outside and the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke with her who kept the door and brought Peter in. I mentioned that already. We'll talk more about that. Servant girl asks Peter some questions and this is the denial. Moving to verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. And Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I've said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, who would then have more of a judicial authority than Annas himself by way of the Roman uh, manipulation. And so Jesus tells Annas, ask the people what I've said. Now moving back to Matthew, verse 57, and those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, following this first trial under Annas. So they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled, but Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death and found none, even though many false witnesses came forward and found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward. Again, they're trying to follow the rule of law because they're in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established, but they've already broken the law by having a trial in the night. They're also aware of the fact that they were seeking the death penalty and based on the law, they had to have two full days of trial and then it was after the third day that the person would be killed. But they already knew based on the timeline of where they were with the Passover that they couldn't have killed Jesus uh, until afterwards, but God had a different plan. God had intended for Jesus to die on Passover when the lambs would be slain. It's very interesting. Now... These two false witnesses that come forward are among many. Now, the others apparently didn't have a a story that would hold water. They contradicted each other. They made up stuff that there was no foundation for, and they were looking for something actually uh, convicting. And they found two false witnesses, and they said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days, which Jesus did actually say. But he was talking about the temple of his own body. And these guys interpreted this as talking about the physical temple, Herod's temple then at that time. Now the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? And Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath. Now this goes back to the law. If you hear an oath or if you are put under oath, you are commanded by God in the context of the law to tell the truth. 
And so they're trying to now trap Jesus into having to testify against himself. And if he didn't, he would then be breaking the law and that would have been a sin and therefore Jesus would not be able to die for the sins of the world. All of these details, they're very cleverly thought out. God knows exactly what he's doing and he doesn't get pushed into a corner by men. <clears throat> so Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Now that's already by itself a discussion. In the first century and earlier, the Jews believed that the Messiah would be the son of God. If you go to Israel today, we ask the Jews, do you believe that Messiah is the son of God? And they do not. They believe that he is going to be their anointed prophet, uh, the one that will come, that will deliver the people, but they do not see him as God incarnate. We call Emmanuel, which means God with us, in other words, God has actually come and he dwells among us in the form of a physical man, which we've talked about and documented thoroughly. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. But they believe that that passage refers to the fact that God is on their side. God is with us, Emmanuel, rather than God is among us as a man. But they did say, do you? then claim to be Christ or Messiah, the son of God. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Now, reading parallel passages, you'll find that he says, I am. I love it. Now, of course, they would just freak because this is the name of God, I am. The, in the burning bush, when Moses asked, who shall I tell them sent me, tell them I am sent you was the response. And Jesus says, I am. Now, it is as you said. So Jesus just claimed to be God. They think that's blasphemy. I find it interesting that some of our, quote, faith teachers, I shouldn't even say our faith teachers, they're not my faith teachers. One, Kenneth Copeland, who said that the Lord appeared to him and told him that he never claimed to be God. Really? Now somebody's going to say, oh, document that. Okay, Believer's Voice of Victory, 1986. I, I can't remember exactly, but it was in the magazine, the Believer's Voice of Victory, and it was in the 80s, I think. <clears throat> Nevertheless, he goes on and he says... I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Hereafter. You think you're going to kill me. Death can't hold me down. There's a seventh interview. Well done. When God raised up Jesus from the dead, that was a, the, the evidence that the work had been accomplished, that it was acceptable to God, and that Jesus Christ is the very image of the invisible God made manifest. And so he does push forward and says, you will see the Son of Man coming, sitting at the right hand of the power and coming. He's seated there now. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Hebrews chapter one. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down. And he is coming again, and he cometh with clouds, the Bible says. But he's coming then in judgment. That's the second coming, not the rapture. He's coming in judgment. The high priest, hearing this, tore his clothes, saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered and said, he is deserving of death. And they spat in his face and beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Mocking him. Now we don't have time to go into any more on this this morning talking about the mockery. 
I have to admit, thinking about all this, and it, it's so big, there's so much information here, that trying to process it down into some bullets that help us to go home with something that is organized in our thoughts has been difficult. But one of the things that I thought about was the fact that when Jesus was praying in the garden, knowing what was about to happen, the first thing that he would know that was about to happen is that he would be going into the process of this trial, these six trials. That he would be mocked, that they would pluck out his beard, that they would put a crown of thorns on his head, that they would beat him. They would make him carry his own cross and he'd be crucified. But the first thing was these accusations in which he would then make a statement that would absolutely polarize everything. I am. That's the first thing that you and I have to decide when we make our decision on the seventh trial. Forgive the Paul Van Oy version of my own liking. Who is Jesus? That is the question. Paul the Apostle documented very clearly for us that he is the image of the invisible God and in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's not a God. He is the one and only true and living God incarnate. So he's not the Mormon God. He's not the Jehovah's Witness God. He's not the God of Islam. He's not the, one of the many gods of Hinduism and Buddhism. He is the one and true living God incarnate. And we must decide that. And we must be certain of it. But I want to leave you with one more thing, and we have just three minutes or so left. We'll develop this further. I've developed it in the form of an hour-long lecture that requires a great deal of attention. But when I think about the fact that he leaving the garden, knowing what was coming, knowing that he would make a polarizing statement, very polarizing, a declaration of who he is, that he was also under trial. And I can't help but think about everything Jesus went through during his crucifixion, his passion, including this trial, that is redemptive. You know, when you hear the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've often heard the preachers tell us he was forsaken that we might never be forsaken. Well, let me add, he was tried that you may never be tried. See, in effect, when you have come to the cross, you have identified yourself in Christ's trial. You have been found guilty at the cross because you said, I am a sinner in need of a savior. I am desperate. I cannot save myself. And you come to know that the living God laid down his life for you willingly for it was expedient that one man should die for the sins of the people, for the people, as Caiaphas put it. And so you identified with him in his death. And if you have identified yourself with him in his death, you also will celebrate with him in his resurrection. And there is therefore then no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no future condemnatory judgment for the believer. And therefore, in this context, when Jesus stands trial, he stands trial not only under the law and under the civil uh, system, but he stands trial for you. It was as if you were the one. And today you say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we identify with him in his death and therefore we celebrate with him in his resurrection. We have a seventh trial. And the decision is, 
what will you do with Christ? As has been so affectionately said so many times. To you, who is the Christ? Who do men say that I am? All these questions that we now answer. And I'm glad that we have the answer. And that we identify with him. There is no day coming, guys. There is no day coming when you are going to stand in judgment. There is no day coming when you'll be evaluated. And where your sins will be pointed out. I know that people teach the judgment seat of Christ and their doctrines about it. And I know people talk about the great white throne judgment. I will tell you that I believe that for the believer, if you have stood at the cross, you have already gone to the judgment seat of Christ. For that was the judgment seat of Christ, where he was tried. He was accused under the law. And he was accused by the civil authorities that you might be delivered from the power of the law and that there may be no judicial mandate for the calling of your death. We now live in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. If this message has been a blessing, won't you please consider partnering with us? Send a financial gift of any size to Candlelight Fellowship, P.O. Box 2555, Hayden, Idaho, 83835. Join Pastor Paul Van Oy each Sunday and Wednesday for our online service or in person at 5725 North Pioneer Drive in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. For service times and sermon recordings, visit candlelight.org.